This is a, a roundtable discussion uh, for counter-racist, uh, counter-racist code, counter-racist language, counter-racist logic, um, anything that uh, has to do with race, racism, white supremacy, and or the production of justice. Um, there, there, there was a list of things that I think we uh, had to discuss. So uh, today's date is April 11th, year 2021, they tell us. Um, so in this round table discussion, uh, anyone can speak at any time. There's no authority. Um, everyone is equal. Uh, so let's jump right in. Is there anything that anyone uh, would like to discuss? Yeah, I have uh, um, a question. You want to go first, zero five? Uh, the question is, what's your question from last week? So you go. Okay, I have a new question. I think my question last week was, why is it that we have um, why have we become counter racist and uh, what's the difference between us and victims of racism who haven't um, perceived uh, raci racism in this way as a as a global system and uh, and uh, the reason I ask that question is so that it, it would be possible to um, help improve our interactions with uh, victims of racism and probably help them solve problems. Yeah, I think there's a, a question for each individual person uh, to answer. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I have always noticed that... Uh, there was something incorrect um, that uh, people who looked like me, even from an early age, I noticed people who looked like me were not treated the same. Um, and I was surrounded by other people who would talk about things like that. Um, not my parents. Uh, I mean, their, their focus was to ensure that their children were successful according to whatever definition that they had for the word successful. Uh, being able to uh, not so much focus on the immediate, I suppose, you know, food, clothing, and shelter, but to be able to live uh, sustainably uh, but um, there were lots of other people um, I was surrounded with who understood that things were not right, and I would listen to their conversations. And uh, even at a young age, I, I developed um, that kind of thinking and would notice things. Um, so uh, counter-racism is not a new thing. Uh, there are a lot of people throughout history who were practicing some form of counter-racism. Harriet Tubman, for example, practiced some form of counter-racism. You know, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, there are a lot of people throughout history that have done that and um, have used some of the same language that you'll read in the code book or in the ISIS papers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, as an individual person, I'm, I'm just I'm carrying on that legacy, doing my part uh, to produce justice, just as many before me have done. I'm not different from them. Uh, I'm the reason that they existed to carry on the fight.
So if anyone else wants to respond, uh, please do. I could go ahead and respond. Um, so I believe I, I ended up here um, attempting to practice counter-racism. Um, similar to kind of what Mr. Edward was saying, I've never really had a lot of people around me talk about racism, um, but I started to really begin to notice uh, like uh, that, it, it's it's almost normal, right? Specifically when the shootings started happening and they were becoming more um, televised and you would see them more often, that when black people were getting shot, it, it, it was almost as if nobody cared. So I started to notice that this is, this is happening a lot. Um, I would discuss it with friends. Um, particularly, I had one friend or sorry, one associate who was in the in the Navy. And we were having a discussion about some protests that were going on in Seattle and people were burning the American flag. And I remember him kind of saying that that was inappropriate, that people can be upset, but they shouldn't burn the, the American flag. I remember saying, oh, well, people are, people are dying and people are upset. I think that's a way of protest. But the fact that he was more concerned with the flag being burnt than, some, than somebody losing their life, you know, I started to realize that that's kind of inc- that's very incorrect. <laughs> um, in particular, what kind of really put me on a path or one of the one of the things was uh, Philando Castile's death um, when he was shot by a race soldier in front of his uh, his daughter in the car. He had all of all the necessary paperwork and whatnot to carry a a weapon, but he was shot. And I don't believe that that race soldier faced any kind of uh, any kind of charges or went to jail or anything. Um, I remember that that really affected me. Um, and then some time had passed. I, I hadn't really gotten into reading books, but, you know, uh, I was very active on Twitter. So my Twitter began to change. I started kind of posting more things about racism. Um, and I... And I began to notice that nobody actually really cares about about racism. A lot of, not nobody, but a lot of the people around me, a lot of the people uh, in these spaces, they don't care about racism. Um, I I began a uh, late. Some time had passed, and I find myself getting into almost arguments with people on Twitter. Specifically, this it was a white male who I kind of knew but didn't really know. I uh, just know, know, knew him from maybe a party or through a friend. Um, we were arguing about uh, the vaccine, and um, I was just kind of going back and forth with him. And then it just kind of dawned on me, like, I don't know, we're both sitting here kind of arguing about something we don't fully understand. You know, we can go back with each other, we can go back and forth with each other all day, but we both don't understand what we're talking about, right? We're getting our information from Twitter, you know. So uh, I just decided to start going to the source. Start, I decided to start reading books. Um, the first book, that I picked up was uh, a compilation of speeches by Malcolm X and the miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. And that kind of put me on the, the path to, uh, count, to counter racism. Um, I believe that's how I ended up here today, just really trying to understand what it is that 
we're dealing with, or what I'm dealing with. Um, I hope that answered the question. Um, I'll like to go next. Um, I would um before I join this book club and um knew and was learning about the system. Um, I knew a certain extent about racism, but I didn't know that I knew racism was outside of my home, but I didn't know racism could be, you know, inside my home as well, meaning, you know, like you're on the Internet, TV, commercials, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I never seen um, racism as indirectly as I was supposed to see it growing up. Um, so I used to always wonder and read articles, and I still just wouldn't get why things were a certain way or why is it so detailed in this way. And I just didn't know where to look or who to go to or where to find how the system works and how it functions. You know, I would hear little lectures or read little articles, but I just didn't know the gap, the gap of the details of the system and how it functions and how it works. Um, so... Last summer, um, I had someone that I went to high school with, and they became all of out of the blue. They were such a big Trump supporter, and um, you know, uh, I guess a little black girl got shot at some protest, and he was trying to blame it on, um, I guess Black Lives Matter as opposed to the person that did it. And, um, you know, he was always trying to battle people of, you know, this whole Trump thing and getting reelected. And I just didn't understand why or what was the point. Um, eventually, I think earlier last year, I ran into 0526 and – to hear him talk about things that I felt like I couldn't talk to a lot of people about because they didn't understand as well as me was kind of like, okay, well, there's somebody that knows something or that's looking for the same answers as I am. So once I got to read the ISIS paper, I, um, it, made me really open my eyes and really see the system as for what it is as opposed to, you know, being as blind as I was. So I felt like, you know, because I felt prior to this, I have a purpose. I didn't know what my purpose was, and I was just living to live for my child because she needs me. I start to feel more like I was in my purpose. Like my job is not to just live comfortably or um, not comfortably, but just existing under this system. My job is to do something about changing um, so that everybody could seek justice not just for my, you know, um, you know, my child. It's for all the youth and all of us as well because um, who wants to just exist in this work earth and you don't know your purpose. So I felt like this was my purpose, was to actually learn, educate myself, try to spread the word as much as I can and, and actually do something about it 
And then there's people out there that they're not doing anything about it or they don't know what to do or they don't know the the gist of the system and how it's functioning. They don't know if they're refining it. So I try to stay codified and as possible um, to know what I should be doing and what I should be doing and how can I change the things that need to be changed. Can I be heard? All right. Um, I can answer now. Um, so um, I've always have had, um, you know, I would say the majority, I would say until I was about um, 28, um, I have always functioned as a um, very incorrect thinking person. And um, when I got into um, higher education at um, UC Berkeley, I started um, seeing a uh, therapy, therapy therapist. And um, I was, um, it was an opportunity to really reflect on how incorrect my thinking was and how um, dis disassociated I was from um, society. I, I really didn't care about um, people, places, or things, or not much of anything. I was just kind of just on automatic, just going with the flow. And um, I um, didn't value any life or any relationships for the most part. I was um, just just very uh, much a um, monstrosity due to um, the training I received by the system of white supremacy and also just by the trauma and the symptoms of my own trauma. So once I um, discovered how traumatized I was and I was able to connect the dots that, oh, wow, the, seeing the things I've seen and experiencing the things I've experienced has, has really done a number on me. I suspect that this is the case for um, most black and brown people. So it was then that um, at that time where I had decided I would dedicate my life to um, healing and mending the minds and the trauma of um, black people and brown people. And uh, my first endeavor into this um, started when I was, uh, I got a um, grant, a self-funded grant to do my own little program where I was um, totally in control. Um, I didn't have a boss. I was able to um, go into Carver Middle School and um, the goal was to um, teach um, the youth, middle schoolers, um, how to deal with their um, trauma because I thought, you know, once we, if you get to the root, which is trauma, then um, it should be pretty easy, you know, if the students know that they're so um, dysfunctional because of their trauma. So I got into the classroom and um, unfortunately um, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough to um, keep the um, students um, just me knowing about trauma wasn't enough. I had yet to discover the the system of white supremacy. So my program wasn't as successful as um, I would have hoped. Um, I had some success, but um, I wasn't able to um, do what I wanted to do, which was pro which was to produce um, serious um, students. I wanted the students to stop clowning around and stop being silly and just stop being um, incorrect. But um, then COVID had um, started in around March, and by that time, um, my cellmate had introduced me to the Cows radio show, and they were um, doing a book called The Delectable Negro. And I listened to probably like 10 minutes of it, and I was like, hold on, I'm not going to just go off of what these people are saying. I'm going to actually buy this book myself and read it myself to see what's see what, what's going on like is it really white people causing all this trauma and if so 
why. So reading the Dustin Double Negro, I discovered that, oh, okay, white people are doing really, really um, grotesque things, and I wanted to know why. And then I um, eventually got my hands on the ISIS papers, and when I read the preface, I felt that I had finally um, discovered my purpose of helping to solve this problem. And then I, I had knew that this information needs to be in the minds of black people everywhere, like everywhere. So I um, began uh, the book club around the time where I started reading The Delectable Negro, but the book club um, foundation is the code book and the ISIS papers because those are the two books that I just wish I could mind and plant in every non-white person, black person, especially because it has done so much to um, correct my thinking and aid my thinking and my journey to um, produce justice. So my confusion took me to be in a kind of racist, me wanting to understand what the hell is going on and me wanting to help black people led me to um, the code and the ISIS papers. And that's my, that's it for me. Am I next, uh, Edward? I'm sorry? Am I next? Or right, has anyone, anyone else joined the call? Anyone can go at any time to a round, round table discussion, so... And no one needs to raise their hand or anything like that. It's just, you know. It's just that people, I invited uh, Jamal to call if he has. I'm sorry. Joined. I invited Jamal to join the call. I don't know if okay. he has called. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I we can hear. Hello. Hey. Good night, everyone. So we are um, talking. The, the question that was asked was, like, why are we counter-racist and, uh, you know, what's, why is it that we are different from other non-white people in how we see uh, the problem? And, um, and we were taking... Um, Edward's answer was that uh, this is probably something everyone has to answer themselves. So we were taking time to tell our story. Edward told his, then Ash, then uh, and 0526. And um, if you want to tell your story next, you can. Or you can, or if you want to wait a little while, I can tell mine. You decide, Jamal. Oh, can you hear, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Yes. Oh, very good, very good. Okay. Um, let me ask you again to clarify the question, please. Why are you, uh, why are you interested in the code um, and counter-racism? What's the difference, what mm. do you think is the difference between yourself and other non-white people who may not... Uh, have this interest or this viewpoint or, you know, whatever your viewpoint is. Um, and uh, what has happened is that everyone has basically tried to tell their own history, their own story about their life and when they, you know, you know, where they are. And you and I have had some um, discussion about that and probably you could um, share, or and go ahead. Certainly, go ahead. certainly. Or do you want to go ahead? No, I'm I'm happy to contribute. Um, it's a it's a very good question, and I'm sorry that, or I'm saddened that I wasn't able to hear some of the other responses, but. Um, For me, the concept of racism, white supremacy, uh, 
became a very personal journey like it does for all of us right around high school. For me, it started in high school where I was bust. I'm from Boston originally, Boston, Massachusetts. Very cold climate, but very uh, segregated in its ways. I was in a busing program uh, from young and was bused to a white suburban school district and and I was from elementary school and hated black folk uh, until high school when I started to really verbalize some of my opinions and uh, I'm somewhat light skinned not very light but I'm somewhat light skinned and I've always gotten along with teachers and you know teachers pet sort of thing I'm nerdy but a little cool so I jumped in between all of the different social groups that were around white and black because Metco the busing organization had like a clique you know the black folk we kind of stuck together um but I, I really <laughs> we also participated in this host family thing where the white family hosted us every month for a few hours and that was really interesting because I was exposed to this stuff that a poor kid in Boston wasn't exposed to new form milk and uh, people having funds to just dispose of indiscriminately for whatever the kids wanted um, Johnny screaming at his mother and, and thinking it was cool you know none of it, it was a total cultural mind warp and and um, so I hated black folk you know I, I think the programming worked very well I started voicing that opinion was told by mom uh, no that's not gonna work and friends in the hood were like yeah let me throw some books at you started my schooling came down to University of Miami which is way on the other side of the United States um, uh, north to south and uh, went to University of Miami and started reading and delving into uh, as much African history and understanding of uh, ancient commit and um, so Chancellor Williams and Ivan Ben Sertima and um, I, there was a, a brother that was touring giving these edutainment series of lectures <clears throat> but I also caught up with some of these videotapes of a brother Daoud stands out to me like I can't even find this brother now but so I just delved into this stuff and I was always the nerdy kid so it was always something interesting that um, people were kind of idiotic in their approach uh, whether they were in my school or in college it's it was it was fascinating to me that I feel like I had somewhat of a, a good upbringing because the kids were just so rotten and spoiled here down south but that wasn't much different than some of these white kids that I went to school with in Lexington uh, near Boston and um, yeah so it's always been fascinating to me that that students would have such weird upbringings and think that that racism was okay or that it's okay for us to hate ourselves and not understand why so when I was presented the opportunity to uh, connect with this brother doing the presentations I befriended him and I started hanging out at his house because he lived down here and uh, he happened to be he happened to be the uh, president of the Egyptology Society here in Miami at a local museum and I was working out of his house and he turned out to be a former dietitian for Muhammad Ali so I was kind of smitten and, and I, I just ate voraciously of the information that he was throwing my way because you know I'm, I'm late teens uh, early 20s I, I worked with him for a good three years three four years but yeah so because I was the outcast anyway this this trying to figure things out was always part of my uh, shtick and 
I belong to, I don't know, uh, Silent Warrior, if I had told you about an unnamed African cooperative I belonged to way back in the day. But it, it was interesting to connect with people who had this great amount of knowledge, because um, many of them were, were quite uh, scholarly, and they were just regular brothers and sisters from the uh, neighborhood. But we were infiltrated and um, watered down. Uh, agendas got uh, corrupted, if you will, and, and it just fizzled out. Um, and it left a really bitter taste in my mouth. So, and that was when I was 20. I'm 50 now. So we're talking 30 years ago that I've been seeking and trying to understand what we could do with this. I know I had heard about the compensatory code system back then, but never picked it up and read it. Um, didn't see anyone who had really delved into it and worked with it. Um, I knew of Juwanza Kanchufu's contribution with Kwanzaa, but wasn't really that into practicing it. Um, I think now, because of my relationship with Silent Warrior, it's, it, and where I am in my life in particular, um, it, it just is hitting me at a particular moment where I really appreciate what the code is bringing to the table. Um, in terms of an approach, uh, my approach in particular has always been my own. Um, I appreciate Silent Warrior was saying that, you know, I sounded like I was just doing me in our uh, round, uh, our discussion group, I think it was Thursday or Wednesday. Um, and that sounding like me was kind of just throwing out um, things to be questioning what people were saying. And that's really not my intent. I try and become clear in my understanding by asking questions. So I do like to ask a lot of questions. And perhaps my approach, because of my upbringing, brings me to questions that aren't typically asked. But I certainly appreciate and uh, welcome other opinions. I simply know that my my path has brought me to a place where I feel as though there's a lot to recognize in terms of our differences. And as a as a brother from the hood, bust to this to this white and programmed in this white system, it was real clear that it's it was it would be difficult for me to fit anywhere. So I just have fun wherever I am, or at least I attempt to. And um, I, I definitely don't appreciate religious dogma, but I do appreciate the spirituality that our people have quite a bit had throughout history. And I don't mean to be too long-winded here, so please, anybody cut in if I'm going too long. But um, the religious component, I think, is... is very important because so many of us get stuck on this uh, lack of purpose, uh, as the sister, as I heard the sister discussing a little earlier. And religion can provide that purpose without that religious context. We're almost lost. So a big part of my life has. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one piece missing from my childhood that wasn't described was the fact that moms went from religion to religion while I was very young, from like eight until, well, no, more like six. So anyway, I jumped around from several religions, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, we were raised initially Baptist, um, a Yoruba religion with Orishas. And I got pretty much into these, even though I was, Seven, eight, I, I was pretty ticked that mom dedicated so much time. And at, at the Orisha, um, in the Orisha religion, it was fascinating because I would have to chill with the Madrina, um, the priestess, their ch her children. 
and would hear some of the stories that they had to relate and garnered a, an appreciation for why we ended up leaving that, uh, that religion that she participated in. So because religion is such a big part of folks' identities, I kind of didn't stick with any because of that. Do I hear someone trying to get in? Maddie heard? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Oh, very good, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, so religion was real interesting in, in my experience there, and it, it had me wanting, if you will, for an understanding throughout my years for what this religious thing was about and whether spirituality was a better fit for what I was striving for. And the spirituality became that bigger piece. Um, I was a bit of an outcast, Mr. Nerd, and wanted purpose, wanted uh, how to include was a major question, or include myself was a major question for me that I answered by trying to understand many religions. Um, the, one, the one area that I really didn't delve into large are the many re religious contexts in Africa besides ancient commit and this Yoruba religion that I belong to. I understand there are quite a few more that I, didn't, I haven't examined. But Buddhism I checked out. Um, uh, some of the um, uh, Native Indian, Native American Indian tribal religions uh, were fascinating. So I, I've delved into quite a few. And, man, Sister brought up um, her experience with the fellow that was doing some of that pro-Trump stuff. And Warrior and I have gotten into many a uh, good discussion about this whole Trump thing. And, you know, my thing is, is off of the beaten path where it's like I don't really care about any orange person or, or white person for that matter, but I care about us making a house that's stable and on a stable foundation, whether it's my house, our neighborhood as a house, our village as a house, we're building it upon a land in which these people have been ransacking houses, not just ours, not just black, not just, you know, colored, not just off-white. They, they're ransacking everyone. And I feel as though the, the crux of the matter is whether or not we're able to build properly when the foundation is not sturdy. So I've had appreciation for some of the Trump stuff simply because he was bucking some of that status quo. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Agenda 21. There was a meeting in November of 2019 where they laid out what the elite have planned, and they backed it up with a magazine, a full page, I mean a full, a front page discussion and examination of this Agenda 21 in uh, Time Magazine. And it's amazing. You know, this is stuff that I've been researching 20-something years ago, and here it is coming to fruition. So trying to wrap it up. The, so this has been my approach, you know, trying to figure out what will allow us to have the most stable property or the most stable house built upon a stable foundation because if they're implementing Agenda, agenda 21, it doesn't matter what color you're rolling with, you're going to get got. Getting got means chipped. Um, the vaccines supposedly have like a, a shelf life, a half life of, of um, 18 months so that in three years you may not be here because of the vaccine. And this isn't it, it's not like conspiracy theory. It's, it's words written by folk 
that say what they're going to do. So it's, it's just interesting. So that's where I'm coming from in my approach. Does that answer the question? Did I give too much? <laughs> Anything I missed? We can Anybody want to chime in? I, I think it's my turn say again? to share. My turn to share. Thank you. Okay, so um, I uh, I, my parents come from the countryside in Jamaica. My father's the first uh, in his family to get a degree. Married my mother pretty young in the early twenties. Um, he studied in Texas for a little bit with us, came back, he put us into an international school, put me in an international school where 80% of the, well not 80, but basically it's where all the expatriates or people who work in the embassies send their children to this school and a few wealthy Jamaicans. So from 3 to 13, I'm with people from all around the world, and we're following an American and English syllabus in Jamaica. After 13, got into, we have an exam that you have to take in order to go to high school, and that's where I um, went to a high school in Jamaica with 95% of the population is black and there are the top 5% of students in the country, smartest. However, um, immediately, well, they're teasing me about speaking like a white person and not being able to speak Jamaican. And I'm also noticing that these much smarter, quite wealthy Jamaicans, um, kids, that they feel inferior to white people. And, you know, if they were, to, if they come across to, I remember once they went to my old school to take gymnastics classes, and you could, I could tell by their body language that they felt intimidated by these white people and somewhat felt inferior to them. And I was really curious about that. Like, why is it? Why didn't these, my fellow black Jamaican kids, why didn't they have the same level of confidence that I watched uh, these um, white children and grew up with, watching these white children have all of this confidence about themselves and their place in the world? Um, becoming a, as I became a teenager, I was no longer really that cute. With um, I can see with my white friends' uh, families or with white people in general. As I hit puberty, just before I left this uh, international school, started getting treated differently. I was in like this exceptional class. I got taken out of it like half a year before leaving the school. This white woman that was running it had said, like, oh, you're not participating that much. Anyway, it was good. It just made me have more time to study for the exam to get into high school. But I, all through all this time from 3 to 13, I know that I had to behave in a certain way to be accepted by white people or to be see, seen as smart or to, you know, just to be accepted as a person. And I saw how my father and mother operated around these people and I, you know, versus black people versus what we'd go to the countryside. Something was different. I always knew that something. I always knew I had to act a certain way. And more or less seemed to be successful at it. However, um, when I went to this high school now, they're saying, oh, you don't even speak like a Jamaican. Um, you speak like an American, you're weird. 
So, anyway, but at the same time, I'm looking at them and like, you guys, I can see that you feel that you're inferior. And now that I think about it so many years, I can see that I felt that I was inferior growing up with the white kids. Anyway, so this clash of um, spheres, I mean, this contrast was very, very sharp for me. And I, I think I saw things that, um, because of that, that probably no one else saw and probably no, not even my parents would see. Um, my father had a book in his library called, that was called Black Like Me by Griffin. This white man who puts um, chemicals in his skin and becomes black and um, goes in the South and experiences life as a black person. And a couple of years after being at this high school, I read this book and um, realized that uh, what, what, what racism meant that, um, that white people and the white people that I grew up with really see and experience life different than me. Um, uh, my parents' uh, marriage started to falter and things became difficult for us. Um, and that conflict uh, and my, you know, I'm in the middle of... Uh, puberty and teenagers, all of this is making things quite challenging. But thankfully, Malcolm X, the movie comes out and, um, you know, then I I hear Malcolm X on the radio. It turns out to be a, a new radio program hosted by someone named Muta Baruka. I He said that he has a bookstore in um, New Kingston, I go to the bookstore after school, and he so generously loans me a book called uh, African Civilizations. I think it was John G. Jackson. Uh, I read that within like two or three days, gobble it up, and he just gives me access to his library, his personal library, at the bookstore. And so... I got a job at that tiny bookstore that summer, and that's when I met um, Dr. Wilson's ISIS papers. I know I was, I, well, w before I met the ISIS papers, I realized that Jesus was not white, and that really sh took me for a loop. Um, I was like, I was, I was quite furious to have been lied to. And uh, I was beginning to see, like, how messed up um, the system was. You know, my family's not necessarily, um, you know, I'm the oldest of three children at the time, so, and my parents are distracted. Um... So I'm mainly figuring this out for myself. By the time I, but I'm really wanting to know why. Why is this all of this line? Why is all of this? So why didn't I know this about my her, uh, my heritage? Why am I only seeing roots on TV? Um, you know, every Christmas and Easter we get in the white Jesus and the white Israelites on TV. We only had one station in Jamaica. We get in all of this, and we go to Sunday school, and we get in white people in the book. And keep in mind, almost everybody in Jamaica is black. Um, of course, there's a very strong um, hierarchy going on, and if you see a white person, you think that they must be wealthy or better off or whatever. Anyway, so I, once I got the ISIS papers, I was searching very hard for the answer, and I really appreciated that work. 
And it was the first time, I'm reading it at 16 years old, and it's the first time that I am um, reading anything that academic. Um, I've been warmed up by all of the books um, previously that I've been reading from Muta's library. But I took that book apart with a dictionary, man. And I felt I got the answer. This is a very good answer for the problem, and it exposes these uh, races uh, as a paper tiger, more or less. And yeah, I can solve this within five years as long as I get the word out properly and get it out to, to enough people. I um, that's what I that was my analysis at sixteen. This is going to be solved by I'm twenty one. Um, I write Dr. Wilson. First time I wrote someone that was so far away, and she wrote me back and sent me a copy of the ISIS papers and the code. And um, when I read the code, I felt that this was way too simple. Um, I didn't have a good appreciation of philosophy and uh, how things how things logically. How you know how the world, how we perceive reality. I didn't fully get that. I really drank up the symbolic analysis, um, but I thought the code was a bit too simple. But right now, at my age, and with the experiences I've had, it hits the spot in a good way. Having a good code, a good, um, yeah, it's important to have a code. So um, I became known at high school as a person who was talking about racism. And um, so while everybody else is like learning to drive and going to parties and getting in relationships, my mission as a teenager was to solve racism and to discuss it and to make sure my fellow black students, you know, I would be sharing some of the books I got. I would be talking with some of them. I mean, I even contacted a girl that was a German girl that still lived in Jamaica. That was I was one of my thought what was one of my good friends, and I asked her a couple of questions, like you know, what does it mean to be white? And um, you know, I asked her things that she I had never I had a conversation with her that. She, we never ever had, and I knew her since we were like four years old. Um, that pretty much uh, put the brakes on our friendship. Um, it was so awkward. Uh, since so, I came. So that was uh, many many years ago, over twenty years ago, and since then I have. Studied. I went back to study in America, worked for the Red Cross, came to Norway, got in a relationship with a white person, got married to a white person. Um, before you know, before I discussed um, marriage, I discussed uh, the ISIS papers with her and to to test her reaction. Um, and I went to the relationship. I I was having a discussion about this earlier, and I said I went into the relationship vaccinated. How I hoped against the worst effects. So I have no children from that relationship, and I deliberately avoided that outcome because I felt that would be very dangerous for the children. And as I think about it now, I can see my own father as an example of how confused uh, you can be when you don't have both parents as clearly non-white. Um, yeah. So in this uh, a year ago, when this uh, when I you know I followed Dr. Wells in time on and off, and I've been following Gus. Here in Norway, I had experienced a bit of racism. Um, I separated from my wife 
and uh, started. I'm involved in student politics and experiencing the racism that they play when you have a little bit of power or influence. And I remember reaching out to God and the calls to get my codification up to be able to to deal with them. And um, after this uh, killing last year, I was like, uh, I'll be on Facebook and I'll be watching what's the discussion that's happening in America. I'm just sad at all of the emotion and confusion. Like Nobody's talking about Dr. Wells since the years. And no one has access to that. Um, and I've... You know, I just know that if they had more access, more understanding of that, they would just it would be they would be less susceptible to the messages of white supremacy. So um, after having joined a couple of Dr. Welts in Facebook groups that I felt um, weren't actually able to share the message properly, I decided to make my own. And uh, and to leave those other groups, and and I then I decided to you know try to make a video summary of our work, and I did that uh, you know instead of making all of these posts, let me try and make some some something that's concentrated and good. So I made two videos of um, two of the chapters, and um, I spent reading instead of uh, being on Facebook. And uh, that's what I've been doing since September. And just recently, I thankfully, someone who introduced me to this uh, counter-racist book club, which is um, really valuable to me, because then I get to discuss it with people who are also on a similar journey to be a bit more codified. Um... My question also was, why is it that uh, other people are not like us? And I think it has to do, I mean, sometimes you're comfortable. If I think about my own life, sometimes you can feel a bit comfortable in the system and then you don't feel like challenging it. And uh, sometimes when you're really uncomfortable, then you feel like challenging it. I could be part of it. Or sometimes, like when I first started, it can just be so obvious that something is wrong. It, that you, you can't uh, you can't close your eyes. It's so obvious. So I think that's probably part of the reason why I um, am the way I am. All right, I think that's enough for me. Thank you for the Back to you, Ed. Oh, I, I forgot to mention that I met Ed uh, 20 years ago at Howard when I went to see, during this Welton Institute, I went to look at the Welton Institute because I had been following the counter-racism website, the forums there, the, the discussions there, they would be refining their understanding of the code and there would be white people coming into the forum and it was interesting to see the the, the, the discussions and the back and forth and the use of words to reveal truth. Um, so by that, by that time it had been about four or five years since I had first seen the code. So I could actually, now I was actually seeing them code being used really effectively to to demonstrate how racism is practiced by white people, by 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 their deception. Um, so I decided to come to the Welton Institute from Baltimore down to Washington, and that's when I I believe I met. Um, Ed briefly, and I met uh, Dr. Wilson in person for the first time and was able to tell her thank you for the work that she did. Um, 
Yeah, and now I feel as if um, you know, I have to do this. I have to um, improve my understanding. Like I'm not this, you know, before my grandfather passed, uh, he, he told me that came from the Ashanti, that his grandfather was an Ashanti, came from the Ashanti people. And apparently he's not told this to anyone else in our family. Um, and I feel like that's very special and a, a sign that uh, I, I'm, I'm responsible for maintaining a counter-racist stance. Um, yeah. I feel like this is part of my... Um, I, I can't... I cannot not see it. I remember when I would be... After Dice's Papers, um, like sometimes I just watch movies and it's just... I'm just seeing symbol be de being decoded after symbol being decoded. I can not not see it. I can't not see the symbols. Um, yeah. It, it comes so quickly. Um, but what I really would like to be better at is um, um, following more of the suggestions in the code and understanding them. Because I, I make... I break quite a few of those rules, and I have broken quite a few of those suggestions in my life so far. All right, thank you. Um, is there, um, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for for answering that question. Uh, were there any other questions that we had on the list? Oh, wait, did, did, I don't think everyone. I'm sorry. Did everyone go who wanted to go? No, I haven't yet. May I now? <laughs> yeah, it's a round table, so everyone. Okay, just, speak just make. <laughs> okay, um. Peace and greetings to everyone who, who I may have not spoken to earlier. Um, my journey is 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 strange and to me, but yet I can see the um, the handiwork of the ancestors having a part in it for me. I grew up in uh, uh, me being the only child. I grew up uh, with just my mother and my father, and my mother had already separated, but they were married at some point in time. But anyway, um, I saw very few white people coming up, very few. And when I did see them, it was very rare. So the majority of people that I ever saw were mostly always black people. So growing up that way, I really never thought about racism being a problem because no one in my family knew or said anything about it. I just kind of knew there were black people, white people, other races of people, but I never thought more. But to speed up um, ahead many years, I remember coming to face, I mean, to YouTube um, about three, three, maybe three, four years ago, and it was always a question in my mind is, I'm seeing these various groups, and they're talking about black people and their problems. And I'm hearing all this, but I'm steady saying, okay, well, we got all these problems, but what's the solution? <laughs> that was my whole thing. I kept saying, where is the solution, right? And each group was saying, well, we can do this, and this will be the solution. So I joined that group, and I tried that. And then I realized, no, this ain't the solution. Where is, it's got to be more. So I remember um, about two years ago, I ran into uh, Dr. Santu. I met him through a Facebook friend. Um, uh, uh, I think he goes by the name Raw African Minds or whatever. Sometimes you may see him in Dr. Santu's chat. 
But anyway, he uh, introduced us to a bunch of people, and I'm saying, okay, well, let's see, do these people have the solution? (laughs) So as I'm looking at that, I um, began to, I remember the very first time I heard Dr. Sanchez speak in a Zoom, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, who is this? What is this? I need to hear more, right? (laughs) So I kind of think about that as a beginning, but I still didn't take it seriously. I heard it to the degree that I could hear, but I couldn't hear it enough to move forward in doing it 100%. So what I did do, I remember, you know, we having conversations about it, but I remember him being such a patient person that he never forced anything down my throat. He would share things, but he would wait for my timing when I was ready to pursue more or to ask more questions. And as I began to only think to ask very few questions, I could only learn very little. But I remember him telling me that I needed to get these two books, um, Nelly Fuller's book, The United and Penitentiary Concept Code. He said I need to get that and Dr. Fresh Chris Wilson book, The ISIS Papers. And I said, okay, well, I've heard of those books. He said, you have? Have you read them? I said, no. <laughs> I said, but I've heard of them because some of those various groups would quote script, I mean, not scriptures, they would quote uh, phrases of what they would say. So I'm thinking that's how I know what the book is about, just through those few phrases. But um, I remember that, that that wasn't even, not, that was not a, that was just them probably showing off talking about they had read the book, but never sharing enough to me get interested. But over the period of time, um, uh, right before the pandemic hit, I ended up getting this place with my apartment complex. But I, the thing that was so amazing to me, in the midst of having to put all of my stuff in storage, that these are the only two books that I brought with me. Out of all my books that I have, and I have a lot, <laughs> but these were the only two books I thought to pack with me in my suitcases. Because I was saying, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up reading these books sooner or later. I don't know, so let me just pack it with me. And I remember I didn't even buy the two books. Uh, another Facebook friend bought the books for me. And he would tell me, he said, well, Christine, when you get the books, maybe you and I can have conversations or do some reading about it. That never happened, but anyway. But what I did do, once I did get into it, I did tell him that I had got into the books, and I actually sent him uh, one of the videos that we did uh, from the book club just so he realized that I really did get into it. It just took me a while. But I, I thought about something that he says, uh, once you wake up, it's hard to go back to sleep. And I began to realize something Dr. Sanchu said one time. He said, uh, well, Christine, what is your reason why you just won't read the book? I said, well, I keep trying, and I'll get to certain points, but I just can't push forward because I thought the suggestions literally meant you do every one of these things. And he said, no, Christine, you pick and choose which part of the code you can follow that can produce, um, uh, uh, produce uh, you to produce justice or help you to produce justice. So I said, okay. So... By him saying, what are you afraid of? And as I thought about it, I couldn't remember or think, what was I so afraid of? But then I just realized a few days ago what I really was afraid of. I was afraid that what I was being asked to do in these suggestions were more than I thought I could do. And I was afraid of it. So as I began to look at that later, and the more I dig, and I realize I'm not afraid anymore. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm awfully happy about it. The more I read, the happier I get, because I'm finally realizing this is a viable, logical solution. And that's what, what really would, what had got me before. With the other ones, I couldn't see, as I tried to see the logic in what they were telling me, this is how we're going to find a solution for black people, I could, the logic it came to a point and it stopped. And when I began to read um, Nelly Fuller's book, the logic began to make more and more sense the more I would read it. And sometimes I'd have to read it more than once, but then it started making sense. This is logical, okay? So I had not been thinking logical, so that's the reason why I couldn't pursue. But then as I was reading 
his, I was reading, I got out of his and wanted to read more of Dr. Francis Christmas because it was more of a calmer book for me to read than his. And I realized I can't just stay in her book. I got to read this other book too. So I started Balance Them Out. So when the book club came about, that was the excellent, I had no more excuses for why I couldn't read this book, none. All of those excuses I was putting up, it just wasn't going to work anymore. So when Dr. Sankey told me about the book club, I said, oh, okay, let me try this. But I'm, I'm enjoying book, this book club. I am. I'm enjoying reading because I guess with some people, to read on your own, you might can just do it on your own, but for some people, they need the encouragement to read and read with a group where they can discuss it as they go. And then it's more understandable to them, and it pushes them to continue reading. So for me, that was a, a real plus for me. And then it, it got me to the point that as the more I read, the more I wanted to find ways to share what I was learning with other people. Now, I have, a, I have two Facebook pages. One probably has over 1,500 people on it. One only has probably like 58 people. I basically work out of the one with 58 because – not that the 58 really listening to everything I'm saying, but there are some that are. So I thought if I worked with a smaller group, then it would be easier to share what I was uh, learning. And I found out that um, a lot of people who say that they've heard of, of either of these books, that they say they have, but when you ask them, okay, well, then why aren't you doing anything? Don't you realize these books are a call to action? They require you to do something, not just read. Then it's like they have nothing to say. (laughs) But but I'm just saying, that's why I say once your, your eyes become open to these two books, you cannot go back to sleep. It will not allow you. The only way, I guess some people could because it has happened, but for me, I couldn't go back to sleep once this much truth and logic was presented to me that I knew I had to do more. So in the midst of doing more is what I'm, what I'm looking at now and in, uh, in doing because it's, it's so important to have this information and begin to understand it because when I look at people in my family, we were very, well, we weren't very religious. My grandmother uh, had two rules. She said either you go to church or you stay home and clean up. That cleaning up thing was not going to work for me. So I said, let's do the church thing. Not really wanting to go to church, but I knew if you went to church, you were going to get probably like a quarter dime or whatever, and you put part in the church and buy candy with the rest on your way home. <laughs> but that was my reason with that. So Christianity, i had that, but like I say, not because I ever wanted it. Then later years, I ended up getting married to a pastor, but by that time I'm already in Christianity and my, my, my brain trashing has already started. So I can really um, understand when I hear people talk about a young man, I think that was Dan, when he was talking about how he was drug, dragged from one religion to the next to the next. Well, I didn't have parents necessarily dragging me, but I remember dragging my kids through quite a few of them. <laughs> And then I began to ask, I started dragging them through, and I started dragging myself through some more because I was trying to find the solution. I knew that it was a solution to our problem. I just didn't know where it was or how to go about it. But for me, religion didn't do it for me. So that's why I got out of it, and I just refused to ever go back into it that way because I saw what it did to me. And then the years I spent, I spent, I know, over 20 years in religion as a uh, pastor's wife, and before that I was, uh, I was in ministry, I was a Sunday school teacher, so I knew the whole nine yards of that brain trash, and so I knew that I could not do that ever again. So I had tried to apologize to the few people I had led astray with that, Now they don't want to accept. Well, they accept the apology to a degree because now they really want to hold on to it. I guess I did an effective job in brain trashing them that now they don't want to leave it. But, <laughs> but it's just that... Um, and so much encounters our lifespans and how we uh, get to our various roads, but this road to me makes sense. It just makes sense. And then because it's so logical, it's actually funny because you would think it would be harder, but it's so logical that it's just easy. So 
for me, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm appreciating both books. I'm appreciating even more the people that I run into who really are reading the books, who really understand the material, that as they help me to learn even more about um, uh, living the codified life and learning how to express this to others where they may want to become a part. But um, I, I'm really enjoying the ride. I, I, I thank ancestors for guiding me this direction, for all the people that had to cross my path to get me to this direction. But I want to say this to Mr. William. Um, Dr. Sanchu had, had several times told me about your site, so I had visited a few times looking at various things, but because I really didn't fully understand what I was looking at or what, what I was supposed to be getting from it, I didn't really grasp all that I should have been getting. So now when you see me pop over there grabbing little things and sharing it, it's because now I really get it. I really, really get it. And I truly appreciate you taking the time to set that site up where people can go and listen to various um, things that or work that you've already uh, done the research on to let us hear how to interact or what are they saying, what are they thinking, what are the black people thinking, and that's so important because other than that, we probably wouldn't have a, a place where we really could go and find that type of information. So I do want to applaud you and thank you so much for the awesome work that you've done with that site. And even more so, I want to thank you for the, um, the book that you sent me. I haven't got into it yet, but I promise I will get into it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do thank you so much for all the work that you've done, and I I want to thank all the uh, uh, the people that are on this uh, line tonight for the awesome courage that it takes to keep pushing in spite of losing friends or so-called friends along the way, because it's just go definitely going to happen. Uh, but it's it's showing you who's real about this. Uh, justice being produced versus who just talking about it and really trying to do anything. So I want to applaud each and every one of you and wish you much success as you push forward. And I'm still believing. Um, um, Dr. St. Hugh would play a song on his channel sometime, and it was by Dead President say, I refuse to lose. And that's the way I feel about this uh, this war against uh, racism, white supremacy. I refuse to lose. Either I'm going to keep working to produce justice or I'm going to die trying. Thank you. I'm using my mic. Amen, sister. Yeah. Uh, so the site is, you know, it's out there. It's been up since uh, 2003, I think. And it kind of morphed over the years, you know, this is just be a discussion site, so you can see some discussion going on. And then I changed it into a uh, counter-racism science, a work-study project. Um, now, when you really have time to do some thinking, I mean, some real thinking about, you know, it's full of... Fuller's book and Dr. Wilson's book, and you know, Dr. Wilson herself refers to her work as a theory, and Mr. Fuller refers to his work as a concept, meaning, meaning a lot of things, you know, uh, haven't been field tested, and and so um, uh, over the years, uh, you know, counter racism discussion board kind of morphed into. Uh, the work study project uh, where uh, non-white people can test, you know, some of those concepts and test some of those theories and see what it is that they could uh, come up with in a scientific manner. So, you know, um, I don't, I'm not a long-winded person, so you're not going to get a whole lot of, you know, explanation out of me, but if you ask questions... I'll do my best to answer him. I have a question, Ed. Yes, sir. Page 229 um, of the code book says that if you don't, I may get it out so I can read it. 
If a person says to you that he or she is white, but you believe that he or she is non-white, what is the correct thing to do? And uh, the code says that avoid all unnecessary interaction with that person until you believe that he or she is either white or non-white. After establishing your belief, interact with that person either directly or indirectly according to the requirements of the code. Um, I w in the Counter Racist Book Club, uh, one of the um, non-white members asked uh, another member whether they were white or not. And that member said that they weren't sure whether they were white or not, that they had a white father and a black mother, and that um, you know they weren't sure. So then the non-white member asked again, um, what does it say on your birth certificate? That would probably help clear this up. And then this member said, it says white on my birth certificate. Um, and then again repeated that uh, they have a white uh, father and a black mother. So it just seemed to be a lot of confusion. And uh, we couldn't see this person. And uh, my position was, my position is that um, I'm confused and I don't know whether they're white or not, and I should probably stay away from that. I should probably, I mean, I'm very much for following the court suggestion in um, staying away, um, not having un any unnecessary interaction because the this non-white, this person that we don't know, that w that says, it says white on their birth certificate, this person is female, and my experience with uh, my track record with uh, white females is not good. I'm easily deceived. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. But I saw that. I saw that that set of questions from this non-white person um, asking someone that you know everybody probably assumed was non-white you know, what they're classified as. And uh, and then when we when when a straight answer wasn't given asking what does it say on the birth certificate, I thought that was a useful sequence of questions. Um I like your commentary on what I've just described. Okay. Um can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh I think I heard part of that uh, in, in the discussion. I, I was there for part of the discussion. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I, I left out, you know, my apologies. But um, a, a lot of the counter-racism science experiments that I've run in the past, over the last 20 plus years, um, and I saw a lot of that going on in that um in that meeting, and uh, a lot of the uh, non-white people were not prepared for what the white people were saying and doing. Can you say that uh, again? I said a lot of the non-white people in that meeting were not prepared for what the white people were saying and, and doing. You know, there were a couple of white people initially, and one of them dropped off uh, after he failed to answer the question um, that I asked, and the other white person uh, answered just in the total opposite of what that white person answered. You know, it was, it was a good cop, bad cop routine. Uh, I don't know if anybody actually noticed that. And that happens a lot, you know, when you get multiple white people in, in conversations talking about racism. Either they'll say nothing or they'll go totally against it. So... Um, totally against what the other white person is saying. <clears throat> Another thing that they did was just to use a, a whole lot of words 
to try to get the non-white person to feel as though the question has been answered when it hasn't been answered at all. Yeah. You know, so one of the ways to get around that is to ask your question such that it requires a yes or no answer. And only accept the yes or no answer. You know, yeah. but uh, the non-white people in, in that meeting uh, did not do that. And um, another thing that they were doing, this is the last thing, and I'll, I'll get to your question. Um, another thing that they'll, they'll do is to, they'll just agree with you. You know, if you don't ask the question in a, that, so that it requires a yes or no answer, then, um, uh, and they don't want to answer the question, many times they'll just agree with you. Oh, yeah, I agree that, you know, yeah, this this is, you know, how things are and blah, blah, blah. But they'll, they'll never answer the question. So those three distinct things took place in that meeting. And... Um, I don't. I don't think you know from from my experience anyway. Um, and and I, I didn't have the opportunity to get back, you know, and say, "Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute," you know, because there were other people in line who wanted to say what they wanted to say, what they needed to say, and mm -hmm. all of their points were valid, you know. Um, but you know, when you start inviting white people to your meetings. Uh, it, the meeting better be real fluid, you know. It's got to be really fluid. When you start running counter-racism science experiments, you're going to get that really quick. You're going to come to that understanding really quick that some of the things that uh, we call structure uh, are not going to hold up against with the fluidity, what Dr. Wilson used to call the dynamics of racism, white supremacy. They're, not, they're just not going to hold up to that. Um, so uh, what what I have done in the past is, you know, if a person says that, you know, I'm white or they say that I'm non-white or whatever the case may be and you suspect that they are not telling the truth about that, what I have learned to do is just treat that person as a person See. Interesting. And once I start doing that, if it's a white person, they they gonna say, "Hey, wait a minute," <laughs> you know, <laughs> "Wait a minute," you know, and they'll they'll try to answer as a white person if they are a white person. I say, "No, no, no, you you're not a white person, remember?" <laughs> yeah, so you you can't say that. How do you treat the person as a person? Yeah, it, it's just a, a person, two people having a discussion. And I'll start to ask questions that um, only a white person can answer. Okay. And that person will try to respond. I say, wait a minute, you can't answer this question. You told me you were not a white person. Now, either you're lying, you know. I mean, it's, it's got to be really fluid. Otherwise, you're going to lose those opportunities, you know, to call people to task for what they say and what they do. Mm -hmm. Now, um, 0526, I uploaded some audio to the Town of Racism website for him to listen to. Have you, have you had a chance to listen to some of that? Is You're talking about the, the white person who's talking about racism? Well, I, I uploaded, no, no, I uploaded two files for you when you asked me for some content. Uh, I've only seen the um, the most recent thing was a white person talking about racism. I didn't see anything else. Okay. Well, uh, those two files are very, very interesting. I, I have a lot more if people are interested. A lot of that content is already in rotation on the kind of racism radio network. Right. You know, uh, you can hear some of the discussions that we used to have, you know, years ago uh, on different platforms and whatnot uh, with white people. 
um, all that information is there. Uh, uh, well, a lot of the information is there on the Counter Racism Radio Network. Um, and I'm going to put this discussion in rotation as well. Uh, but to answer your question, I'm getting tired of hearing myself talk now. So to, <laughs> to answer your question, um, yeah, um, just treat the person. I, that's what I've done, you know, uh, just start treating the person like they are a person, not like they are a white person, and then start asking questions that, you know, especially if you're in a group of people. It really works good. It, it really works good if you're in a group of people because you can find out who the white people are. You know, if you ask a person if they're a white person and their answer is confusing, then you ask another person, you know, is that person a white person? You ask a person that you know is a white person, is that person a white person? Right. And, and watch the reaction. Of course. Very, very different, very different reaction. White people, my observation is that white, I did this with my cousin who said that she had a white baby. And uh, with a white man, and she said, yes, my baby is white. And she was saying this with her white friend sitting right beside her that come to Norway. And I, I just looked at the white friend and asked her, is the baby white? <laughs> and the white person said, no, that's not a white baby. Right then and there. Um, right. My right. Is is that your observation as well that white people will, um, like if you ask a direct question like that, they will be. I mean, I did it again on a Facebook page. Like this woman was saying that Meghan Markle's child looks a hundred percent white. All right, and I, and but then later in the conversation, she's saying that uh, people, what was it? Mixed people. Um, and then she was talking about mixed people, and then she was saying, I had asked some questions pointing out, hey, um, are mixed people white or non-white? She says, okay, they're non-white. And um, if you're not sure, if you see this mixed person with a non-white parent or a black parent, it's quite clear that the mixed person is non-white. So then I said, okay, is Megan white or non-white? Okay, Megan is non-white, and then I said, "Okay, then if Megan is not white, because she, and she has a white parent and a black parent, she's not white, and she's getting mistreated. What does that say about Archie then, who you just called a, who you just said looks a hundred percent white? Um, isn't he also going to be mistreated and treated as a non-white person?" Because because he has a white parent and he has a non-white parent, you know. She didn't really want. She, you know, she didn't really want to answer that. But I just used her own logic and said, "Hey, you're not making sense." I mean, she wanted to talk about uh, white skin being selected for in Europe and thousands of years ago, and you know, she she didn't want to. I just ignored all of that and just used her own logic. Or I attempted to use her own logic to show that what she was saying to me didn't make sense. And that's what I appreciate about the code. Like, you just use logic, ask questions, get your answer. Um, um, ignore any of the extra words and uh, concepts and ideas that they throw that are not connected to what you're going for. And, you know, they'll throw out six different things that you could... Um, you could uh, eventually uh, dig down and expose, but you just I choose just one thing, my original question, and I keep I, I stay on that like a bulldog, and um, yeah, you agree, stay on it like a bulldog, and just be, you, and that's not being rude, that's right. just that's just um, you know that's just uh, refusing to be deceived. Um, as much as is possible. But, I mean, what was so amazing was that until 
um, the non-white person asked that question last week. I thought that, you know, I, I, in the back of my head, I knew there was some hidden, there was some, I knew, you know, that there might be other white people there. I knew that. But what I didn't realize that that person who had spoken before was white in our birth certificate. So that was such a, I think, uh, being able to identify whether someone is white or non-white is absolutely essential if you're going to have a discussion on racism. And the deception that comes up when um, you ask that question is uh, like you have to sort that out because that helps. I think if I if I remember correctly the discussion in, from 20 years ago, like that seems to be uh, one of the fastest way you can find out whether someone is going to practice uh, racism on you. If they will not, if they if they can't give you a straight answer about their classification, is what what do you think about that, Ed? Um, I agree. It's one of the ways. You know, usually, you know, and just to contrast it a little bit, if you ask a black person if they are a white person, I mean, a black person that you know and they themselves know that they are black, quote, unquote. Ask them if they are a white person, you, you'll get a quick no. You know, that answer comes really quick. Now, there is a, a counter, there's a counter-racism science experiment on the website that's titled, Are You a White Person? Right. There's a whole lot of pages of different people asking people if they are white and what their responses are. Yeah. And and yeah, anybody can view that at any time. Anybody can ask somebody if they're a white person and go to that forum on the website and post their question and answer. It is open for anybody to do that. You know, so that that is one one of the ways. I mean, so uh, it's really not complicated, and I don't want to talk about it, though. You know, it's really complicated because it's not. Let's say you got four people in a in a in a room, right? And three of them are white people, and they all agree with each other that they white people. You know, so three of them are white people. And one of them is a non-white person. Now, two of those white people say that that non-white person is really a white person. Everybody follow me so far? Yeah. Okay. But one of those, one of those white people say that that non-white person is, in fact, a non-white person. Now, what does that mean? You know, that means that those two white people who say that that non-white person is a white person is not going to mistreat that person based on color. Because white people are not mistreated based on color. That don't mean they won't mistreat them, but they're not going to mistreat them based on color. Now, that one white person who says that that non-white person is, in fact, a non-white person, that means that's the dynamic part of it. That means that that white person, at some point, may decide to mistreat that person based on color. It's really not complicated. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now those two white people who said that that non-white person was white, now they can change their mind at any time. <laughs> you know, and that that's the situation that we're in. That that's part of the confusion for us. You know, we'll we'll be treated a certain way by a white person, and all of a sudden, boom! And we're like, hey, why are you doing this? And so it was a guy back in the day. Josh Wicket used to post on the work study project when it was a discussion board. 
and even after it began to evolve. And he used to liken black people trying to figure out why they're being mistreated based on color to a child trying to figure out why their parents don't like them. And he was really detailed about the similarities. And a lot of that is written uh, on the work study project. But we've had uh, conversations, and a lot of them recorded some of the content in those files that I uploaded for uh, 0526 to the website uh, that are also in rotation on the Counter Racism Radio Network where he explains in detail what those similarities are. <clears throat> and so it, if I can offer a suggestion is that, you know, don't get stuck in the paralysis of analysis. Don't get stuck on the why part. You know, quickly move from why to how. You know, how they do what they do, what it is that you need to do to neutralize their behavior. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, there, there was a question about the difference in the definitions between white supremacy and racism in the code book. I think 0526 had that question. They say again, Ms. Edwards? The, the difference between the definitions for white supremacy and racism. Oh, yes. Um, well, I'm basically under the... Um, I basically believe that Dr. Francis Chris Wilson and Neely Fuller's um, definition are... Um, uh, are the same minus um, Neely Fuller doesn't mention the um, the numbers game, the numbers aspect, but essentially they're they're the same definition. Uh, they're all based on um, us being mistreated because we are not white. But Dr. Presser, she breaks down. She adds to um, it's because they have to maintain their numbers game, their numbers, and the system is in place to protect and maintain their numbers. Um, this is something that makes logical sense to you, right, Miss Edwards? Would you agree that um, this system is in place for white people to uh, maintain their existence? Um, no, I'm not sure I agree with that. So I've, I've had that, I've had that conversation with Dr. Wilson. You know, but she stands by her theory, as well she should. It's hers. Because so, I'm sorry, your question. Uh, so, um, are you? Um, why do you do you think they're just um, <laughs> mistreating us because they they have they enjoy doing it and and and, and that's the end of it? Um, so, what I told Dr. Wilson was, I said, you know, Dr. Wilson, white white people don't need to. Uh, to mistreat people based on color in order to, to survive. Now, she disagrees with me. She she says it's a survival strategy, so we had some very spirited conversations about that. <clears throat> and I said, well, in order for some pe in order for people to survive, they don't. I mean, black people been surviving, right? We was like the first people. Everybody says. We've been surviving, you know, since the beginning of time. We still survive it, right? But we we not treating all the people on the planet who are not black just because they're not black. We're not mistreating them, but we still survive. 
So why is it white people? You know, have to mistreat everybody who they say is not white in order to survive. Why do they have to do that? So we went back and forth and back and forth, and we just decided to leave it alone. You know, she has a theory, and I have questions that are unanswered, and they're never going to be answered now because Dr. Wilson is not around anymore. Good question. You know, so something to think about. I'm not saying you should believe or disbelieve Dr. Wilson. Dr. Wilson got some very valid points, man. That when I read the ISIS papers, ooh, <laughs> she has some very valid points. You know, we we differ on that one. You know, but uh, you really got to do, you know, you really got to do some work. I mean, practical application. Start applying. Start field testing. What. Mr. Fuller has written and what Dr. Wilson has written. You got field tested. What's the practical value of that? Just to know? No. Just knowing something is not motivation for you doing anything. You have to make it apply. And that that's the reason for the... Uh, work study project so that the individual person, no matter who it is, you know, can post their um, counter-racism science experiments. They can run them. They can post the data. They can post their scientific conclusion, blah, blah, blah. People can ask some questions. Now, I noticed once that the WSP evolved into that type of format, white people stopped posting there all together. Very interesting. They don't want to answer questions? They don't, they don't want to post counter-racism science experience. See, to do so, you have to be thinking about counter-racism. I mean, you really got to be thinking about it, thinking about it in depth. When you run in it, you, they know that they, they're working against the system just by running it, just by thinking about it, just by talking about it, just by doing something about it, they're working against the system. All the white people that were posting that went away. I've even received several emails from people asking me to remove their names altogether. You know. Oh, you know, I ain't removing nothing. You know that site was uh, I, I hold a copyright for that. I ain't removing nothing. Sorry, not sorry. You know. <laughs> That's basically what it comes down to. Um, the stuff that you shared, um, for me, where can I find it at on the site? It's under the files directory, and I think the name of the file is is a number one, number dash one dot m. P3 and there's a number dash two dot MP3. Now those those like I said, that content is already in rotation on the counter racism radio network, but you have to wait for it Yeah. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that's uh the, not the most optimal <laughs> way to listen to it. Right, 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 right. But hey, when I first came out with that, I mean that was people and we still get people from all over the world. You know that listen to it, um, and I can see what country that they're in, but that's that's as deep as it goes. And I post that information on the site. There seems to be a rise in the number of people in Germany. Uh, 
never get a lot of people in Africa. Every now and then, you know, there's some people there. Germany, Sweden, China, um, those are the uh, biggest percentage, the largest percentage of business. And, and of course, you know, the United States. But. Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Um, what, what are one of the questions that you feel like will never be answered because Dr. Wilson passed? Like, do you have an example question that you feel like won't be answered? Oh, um, <clears throat> there's no, there's no one you can ask it to, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you one, the one that I was referring to, which is. Uh, why it is that uh, why does she think that uh, white people have to uh, mistreat people based on color in order to survive there's nothing in recorded history nothing that I could ever find I asked Mr. Fuller he said there's nothing he could ever find either but you're welcome to ask him I mean, nothing in recorded history where millions of black people was going after white people's genes that would make them attempt to compensate by just mis mistreating all of the black people. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing in recorded history where, you know, black people just going through raping and murdering white people. But that's a specific question just about the theory of color confrontation. And nobody knows that better than Dr. Wilson because she wrote it. Now, what do you, you think find? that white people could come to that conclusion without necessarily black people raping thousands, but just living amongst black people and having like a multicultural society, like let's say in like Egypt or Rome, and seeing that all the children were non that came from like white and non white pairings were always darker? I've heard Dr. Wells had mentioned that, but, I mean, I don't know. So this is a hypothetical situation, right? Because nobody that's on the planet right now was on the planet back then. So we're talking about a situation that we think actually happened. And we're talking about how we think white people would have reacted to that hypothetical situation. And, you know, it's pretty cool sometimes to, you know, do thought experiments like that, but I, I just, I don't think about it a lot, you know. My, my, my answer is I don't know. I don't know if they would have come to that conclusion or not. A question that I have, not just for um, Mr. Williams, but for everyone, is: Do you think that it's significant, like it's important to know the reason why uh, white people mistreat non-white people on such a large scale, like in terms of when you're talking to people about white supremacy? Um, really good question. I'd like to hear some answers too. <laughs> um. I would say it just depends on how either your brain works or how your brain has been programmed to work. Because I know for me, um, knowing why, like I, I, I got the, I wanted to know why before I, uh, I wanted to know how. Perhaps that is um, one of the problems. But 
I wanted to know why before I wanted to know how, and I think knowing the why or having my um having a foundation to what I believe to be the why is helps me to um, understand the um, the how, and also further <laughs> furthers my um understanding that how urgent this problem needs to be solved because the why is um, so pitiful. That's my answer. Uh, I, be- I, b- I believe um, <clears throat> it is, it's important to know why as well. I feel that um, knowing how is just as important, but without knowing why, um, I feel that you know whatever strategies we may um, come up with or produce will not will will not be um, complete or will not be able to take into consideration the whole um, the whole state of being. Um, so I believe it's important to know why to come up with a complete strategy. That's just my that's my opinion about it. I would think why is important too, because if you don't know why, then it can repeat itself. But once you know why they behave in a certain way, then it gives you um, a, a a plan to make sure they don't get to keep repeating that. But that's just my reasoning on that. I'm not. I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not sure that uh, we're actually answering the question that was asked. So, you, uh, or maybe I misunderstood the question that was asked. That, that's most likely, <laughs> you know, the case. So, are you talking about why the white people today mistreat people based on color, or why the white people, when racism, white supremacy started? Why did they start doing it? I would say both. Yeah, I would say both, too. (laughs) I would say both as well. Um, In a two-part question like that, um, I guess why today would mostly have to do with um, why they started practicing it in the first place. I mean, for me, why, they're, why they practice it today has a lot to do with uh, them remaining in, the, in their functional superiority in their roles of, in their roles of superiors, um, which, I, which, you know, uh, Dr. Walsing's theory has given me a foundation as to why that is genetic annihilation. Um, I also think it is inherently a part of their being and in their culture uh, to just mistreat people, um, I guess, uh, the, the skin color or classifying people based on color made, made it easier to, to just pick a group to mistreat. So... Uh, if you think it's inherited, how do you think that we can replace white supremacy with justice? Do you think that we have to, like, every time there's a new generation of white people, we have to, like, re almost, like, re-educate them or something? It's, like, natural to them. Um, I think uh, kind of you, uh, I don't know how to... Uh, I want to be careful when I say this, but almost kind of using the same tactics that white people have used on black people to condition them into inferiority. Um, But obviously finding ways to do that without mistreating them. Um, So, for example, how uh, for generations, you know, through slavery, they've kind of instill instill um kind of behaviors into the DNA of slaves and their generations to follow. 
but doing that in a manner where they're not being mistreated, if that makes sense. Because um, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with uh, maybe the, the environment that they that they came from. So maybe taking them out of that environment. I don't know. Okay, so only um, one person. Only one person asked that question, right? The lady mm-hmm. that asked the question. So my question to her was, was she talking about when it started or was she talking about today when she asked the question? Um, I was talking about both because, I, yeah, I was talking about both. So you, when it started that, and how it... You, and. Oh, sorry. You think that it's the same reason? No, I don't think it's the same reason. Oh, see? <laughs> okay. So what do you think the reason was when it started? Why did they start to do that? Um, so we're, get, we're getting into the thought experiment. Yeah. Aspect of it. Yeah. For me, I haven't heard anything more, like, convincing or more that makes the most sense than what doc- than Dr. Wilson's color confrontation theory, mm-hmm. personally, like, yeah. Okay, so why do you think they do it today? Um, like, what the other caller was saying, I think... It has to do with keeping their place in keeping their dominance intact. Oh, uphold the power structure. Yeah, that's what I think yeah. now. Because they know where it came from. It came from, like, mistreating us and killing us. And so they know that it has to, they, it has to stay that way. That's hmm. That's interesting. It's basically saying if it's not broken to them, why fix it? Right. Because, you know, if if we take, if we say that the reason that it started it was because it's a survival strategy, well, what they've been doing all these hundreds of years ain't working because they are disappearing. <laughs> you know, so. That's <laughs> true. It it's can't true. be a survival strategy because they ain't surviving. They are disappearing. So it's they say be- that they're, they're doing, they've managed to become a majority population on a whole other continent like America. So that would seem like they have expanded to some extent. According to white people, they're they're the majority. If survival includes domination. What do you mean if survival includes domination? If you include the concept of dominating all non-white, as the definition of what survival is, if you include that, black people uh, who are not, who, are, who are we dominating? Survival. Um, I, it, it brings me to um, the idea that the architect describes in the Matrix for the Matrix lovers that we have acceptable uh, uh, concepts of survival that we're we're ready to live with. White folk are maintaining a system, and if you include in that system the domination of non-whites, survival means maintenance. Survival means maintaining what that system is and has been, the comfort, the royalty definition that exists for non okay. for uh, white folk. Okay, so I've got a question because... That definition of survival has to change when you start talking about black people. 
So sure. we're not dominating. We're not dominating nobody. So there are different levels of survival, right? And and that's the unfortunate reality of words. When you dig into the etymology of where a word comes from, even that does not help in the usage of a term to describe what we're discussing, what the idea is. And white survival, annihilation. Go ahead. Who will black people dominate? Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't use domination when referring to non white survival. That wouldn't fit. Right, so it has so to be the survival Yes, yeah, it would be too Yep. Yep. Words are, are basically faulty. You know, we're we're trying to represent an idea with nomenclature, with words that just are not very helpful because they mean several things. You know, survival can mean many things, not just whether I can eat, whether I can live. It also means whether I can dominate. <laughs> you know, to white folk, I, I would imagine if they were to be honest, if we really could sit and talk to someone that was an honest white person, it would fit, you know, yeah, you know, we've been dominating for so long, we just, we got to keep doing that. I, I wouldn't. I think it's a sense of state. I'm sorry, go ahead. What if it's like a sense of they feel like um, they, if they lose superior and to be equal with us, then some non white race will overthrow them to try and be superior as opposed to trying to be equal. Or wipe them out. Yep. They already being wiped out. What are, what are we talking about? What are we, but are we I feel like about? the fear of them, of what they've done to a lot of non-white people is the fear of it coming back worse. Okay. So that this retribution. Is very, this is a very interesting discussion. Because, and I've had it many times, and I always ask the question, you know, I preface by saying, okay, so we are in a race war. We're in a race war where black people are being killed. Period. At liberty. And in the process of trying to figure out how to win this war, we are psychoanalyzing white people? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is come a on. conundrum. Come, come on now. <laughs> come on now. See, that's, that's why that's I like sisters. Pardon me. I think that's why it's been, I think that's why it's important to have a, a understanding of what we are dealing with and um i think um what we're dealing with is a entity is a creature is a being that before they are on this planet there is something in their um in their existence that dictates that they need um power and control and they've decided that the best way to achieve power and control is through the mistreatment and torture and abuse of um, non-white people. So um, I think that is um, the reason why they are literally born to be this way. They have um, done things to themselves um, mentally to um, sever a lot of their, um, what we may consider um, human emotions to the point where um, they can mutilate at, um, on a massive level and feel absolutely nothing and this is um, and this is all in order to um, keep up their their numbers because uh, I heard Edward you heard you say that they're being wiped out but if they are being wiped out it's, it has nothing to do with um, non-white people they're either being wiped out by themselves or by um, the laws of nature okay. so I, I, so um, 
Yeah, I just really, um, I think we have to um, understand the enemy to, uh, we have to understand what we're dealing with, so. Yeah, yeah, you have to understand the enemy's weapons, you have to understand the enemy's armor, you have to understand the enemy's tactics, you don't have to psychoanalyze them. Well, that's why I appreciate Sister's uh, question. As I heard it, it was, is it important to understand the lies? And depending upon your journey, it may not be important at all. How do you get from point A to B? You know, how do we as black folks survive this system? And do we really need to psychoanalyze them at all? No. Some of us do. Some of us with that desire to understand and, and really delve deep. But for others, it's just, no, how do I get these crackers off my back? <laughs> so, I agree. Understanding the why of anything is important. But how are you going to understand something that happened hundreds of years ago? Oh, it's still happening. The, the lady that asked the question, asked the question, said, yeah, but for different reasons. <laughs> for diff Even she said for different reasons, and I agree with that. May I chime in a, a little bit more? It, it seems the more we delve into the why, whether it's when it started or what's going on now, it doesn't help us get to what we do in response. I think a part of the, the essence was also, you know, how, how would we inter or how, how would, what would we do, jail all of these white folk that are found to be unjust? You know, what, what would be our response? Right now, we are uh, in an unjust system where we're just slapping people in uh, a box and calling that rehabilitation. It's a private system, it's garbage, and, and that definitely needs an overhaul. But what, what systems have been in place historically to address um, uh, outcast service, or uh, not service, outcast behaviors? You know, someone steals from the tribe, what do you do? Cut their hand off? You know, that's, that's an Islamic uh, way, but is that the best way to stop recidivism and, and to encourage? So I appreciate the idea that we can identify the behaviors as incorrect, but then I think it's, it's definitely helpful for us to recognize further discussion needs to be had, further groups need to be created where we're talking about what actually specifically should happen to the justice system so that we're ensuring non-recidivism, you know? The, the people that are controlling the keys right now, it's good for them to have these boxes where they're making money. I mean, and that's not to say capitalism is bad. It's to say they just don't understand humans and, and they're not try the goal is to make money as opposed to help anybody that's doing something wrong, let alone just white people being white. So if, if we get to the extent where enough people are approaching the code and saying, okay, what we're trying to do is gain justice, then we'll eventually get to a place where those problems, those discussions really need to be addressed. And I'll mute. Well, I, I, I agree with the assessment. And the only reason why I'm saying the lady and her is because I don't, I don't know your name. I apologize. I'm, I'm real bad with names, really bad. Um, but I agree with the assessment that they're doing what they're doing now to maintain the power structure, to uphold the power structure. I don't think they're really concerned about, you know, hordes of black people 
black men raping white women. I don't think they do. For survival? Uh, for whatever reason, depending on how you define survival. I mean, the way I see it is, so uh, over a period of years, you know, hundreds of years, uh, white people did what they ne- did, needed to do in order to get everybody's attention worldwide. I mean, they, they killed a lot of people, raped a lot of people. You know, they did some very horrible things. Um, and not only to adults, to children as well. Once they got everybody's attention, at that point, they were surviving. Because wouldn't nobody mess with them. So they were not going to disappear at the hands of other people. I mean, there were a couple of few incidents, you know, like during what they refer to as World War II, when some people tested them. And then they found out, you know, the hard way. You know, the sun fell out of the sky. You know. And they let, they let those people know in no uncertain terms, no, we are still in charge. So they were surviving because nobody was messing with them. Nobody posed a threat to their survival. They went beyond mere survival, straight over into domination. Now, why do they need to dominate people is the question that I have. Not, maybe not necessarily for this group, but, you know, that's just a question that I have. They were surviving at the point where nobody posed a threat to them. I think it gets back um, to that. I think they had to kill a lot of people in order to get there. <laughs> you know, make no mistake about it. They had to kill a lot of people in order to get to the point where they were survive. I think what um, I think it's Jamal was saying that I think is interesting is that and I and I don't want to I do think it's important to not always talk about the why and to think about more strategies about how to actually produce justice but to like add on to what Jamal was saying previously I think what he was trying to say is that in their mind, they have to dominate to survive. If you go maybe like in the perspective of like they don't have resources and that to have the resources to live like a life, because you know, as you gain more goods, you start to see more things in your life as essential when they aren't like a microwave is essential now for a lot of homes, even though it really isn't. So maybe, like, because of their lack of resources on their own land, right, Europe has no resources, they feel like they have to dominate and take over everyone else's resources just to survive. Does that make sense? Yes, I believe that um, they discovered that their um, land that they call Europe and the other white lands that they um, inhabited, they realized that um, if we don't have the resources we need to um, sustain ourselves forever, thus they began to um, dominate. And it's, it's the idea that it's in their nature rings really true. I mean, it just, it really makes sense in the history of 
black folk, we know that black folk were adored and revered. The Moors were revered until that, that 1400, 1300, um, you know, some say 700, uh, you know, to, to rip from your own history the concept that these people gave you something. It, it goes back to um, that Iceman inheritance concept where they, they don't have any connection with the, with the, the earth. They, they have very little real conscience. Pardon? Sounded like I heard somebody saying something. Yeah. I guess they decided not to finish. But yeah, I, I, I love these discussions in terms of understanding what it actually means to us individually. And, and white folk, like I, I barely care what would make someone, it, it seems like, yeah, the, the whole Jacob's theory, Yahoo theory that he created them from the worst and, and, and uh, blank, blankest slates of, of a human. Like, I don't even care. It's just y'all are disgusting. Y'all are doing something that's disgusting. The, um, these shooters that keep popping up uh, that are always silly white folk getting their, their rocks off, and then they're treated with this reverence. It's disgusting, and we know it needs to stop, so it just becomes how do you treat them? How, do you, how would we want to treat them? And, um, yeah, that's where my head keeps going. Yeah, I don't, uh, I made it a practice years ago, and I'm, I have to apologize to this group. I'm, I made it a practice years ago not to psychoanalyze white people. So when people get into, mm. that, when people get into that discussion, I just back off. You know, I, I just, I don't do it. I so hear you. I guess a, a question I would have, because Mr. Edwards said it earlier, like uh, white people, what drives them to want to control everything? Um, how how do we as non-white people, you know, get white people to stop wanting to control us or allowing them to control us? I think first of all, the business is to stop cooperating with them. Right. So, the, well, the, um, code, the code is specifically designed for that. Uh, I don't. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say I don't. I don't really. I can't say I understand how to just not cooperate unless you put it in context of specific dialogue and tripping up individuals that you communicate with. That's certainly not cooperating. Um, but I know that. When I look at the Nation of Islam as an example, they're cooperating in a lot of ways, but they're handling business. And I look to that as, pardon, go ahead. No, I was just saying absolutely. I'm agreeing with you. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a a brother that I post in my Welton site regularly who refers to Claude Anderson's book, Powernomics, as well as, uh, just him, Dr. Boyce Watkins, and I mean, I love the, the the information he puts out on a regular basis, and his position is, uh, it's interesting, I've never heard him speak of Cal, I've never heard him speak of Dr. Welsing, I wonder if the brothers ever caught up with them, I have yet to write, but it's, it's interesting how splintered we are, uh, those that have 
and those that recognize and understand. Um, had uh, brother Ed, do you know uh, whether Welsing and Fully, Fuller, or or even the Cal uh, radio program has ever dealt with like Claude Anderson and, and some of the concepts that they promote? Yeah, I, I've I've listened to him for years. Oh, and that's the stuff. Yeah, Asa Hilliard and Maulana Karanga, and I mean the list goes on and on and on. Mm. For years. Mm. So for for me, it's it it comes back to that splintered thing. It's it's a real challenge for us you because know, it it seems like we're we're all trying to do something in particular, and. I don't see the solution as something in particular. I think as we continue to build, Anderson has his concepts and, and Watkins is falling in that. Um, even Ice Cube come saying that he wants to do something that would be political party-esque. It's like, you know, God bless them. That's my pr- approach. It's kind of like bless everybody in their separate uh, modes of operating. We, right. we know that we all need to eat. And we're a propaganda machine away. Like, I'm, I'm, I still haven't heard uh, Boyce Watkins' piece yet. Young Pharaoh is talking about doing his thing. Hotep, little Hotep, is, is talking about his. Everybody's saying that they're doing things, but we've been saying that for the years that I've been studying. So I just look forward to either being able to create it or fall in line with as many of these that pop up, because we've got a lot of millionaires right now that claim to be awoke. Yeah, I've I, I read so many books on the subject that I just got tired of reading. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I, li- I listen to so many people talk, and have talked directly to many of them until I, right. I got tired of listening to them talk. You know, black people, we're not going to be able to spend our way out of this problem. Spend? Do that. Yeah. Ain't no way. Monetarily? To up. Yeah. Hmm. It, there's no way to build up a black economy that's going to wipe out the white economy. There ain't no way to do that. Hmm. Ain't no way to. Do you think that's that. necessary to wipe out the white economy? You think that's necessary? I have no idea. That's oh, okay, that's, okay. That's not something that I'm looking at doing, but that's something that I've heard people talk about. Gotcha. You gotcha. Know, let's let's hmm. build over here. Start our own community. You know, in this part of the hmm. jail cell. That's, you know, <laughs> yep. it, it ain't no way to ain't no way to do that. Uh, that's no a do that. that's um something that I've kind of been thinking about lately, specifically a uh, Claude Anderson is paranomics, because essentially you're participating in, in capitalism, which is a uh, a system based off mistreatment. So can ow. Can, can black people, you know, participate in that and at the same time liberate themselves? I don't know. It, I it think depends on how it depends on how they do it. I I, I think it might be that's powerful, right. But it depends on how they do it. You're back to that how word, you know, not the why word. It depends on how they do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I would say it's more possible to use them. Um, power economics to um, fund um, some sort of um, initiative to teach non-white people about uh, racism, white supremacy, and producing justice than it is to, like, use this system, this money system that they control in its entirety. Um, I I don't see um, capitalism or, or, like, us using economics to, to solve this problem, just like the same way I, I don't see um, us using um, arms t- 
to um, solve the problem. Um, a final thing about um, the nature. I think if um, we all understood that um, white people like are what Bobby Wright said, they're um, just psychopaths, and a psychopath can can manifest in an infinite amount of ways. And um, perhaps if you all have that approach that we're dealing with psychopaths, we could um, spend less time on the psychoanalyzing and <laughs> more time on um, producing justice. Yeah. That, that, okay. could be a, that could be a way. I'm sorry, somebody was saying something. I find it interesting that when y'all bring up um, Claude Anderson and um, Barge Watkins, and like you say, I've never heard them mention Dr. Francis Chris Wilson or Neely Fuller's book, but from what I have uh, learned or rumored about Boris Watkin is that it's either his stepdaughter or his daughter married a white man. So I would definitely know he couldn't have read Neely Fuller's book about that because if that was the case, he would have um, objected to that. But um, I'm assuming they, neither one of them have read the book. So well, I would expect... How do we know he didn't object to it? Okay, I'm just saying, I've never, I used to follow Boris Watkins, right? I've never heard him. In the conversation that I've heard him, I've never heard that. So that's the reason why I said I find that uh, interesting that that from what I have learned about them, neither one of them talk about that. So it's not like, um, it, it appears to me, but I could be wrong. It appears to me that if racism is brought up, it's brought up to the point of not eliminating it, but to say we can work our way out through raising our finances. And I don't think we can at least based on what I've seen them do. I don't think that's the way that it can be done. Right. But that's, that could be my opinion. Yeah, I agree with uh, Christine or Ms. Williams and I in 05 that it, it could possibly be used as a tool to, like, gain funds to, like, produce justice, but I don't see it as, like, an avenue to actually produce justice. And I... Something, to me, like, I've researched Claude Anderson, and I know that he was working with a black bank and did something shady where he owes that bank a lot of money. So it's hard for me to trust someone who talks about, like, banking black or, like, if he's mistreating other black people in economics. I don't even know if the, if the person who's, I guess giving that information cannot even stand by it. It's hard for me to to see it like happening with all black people personally. Well, you know, stay focused on the usual suspects, right? On the white people who practice racism, white supremacy. I mean, they have shown that that's you know that's not going to work. They've shown that's not going to work. We've had thriving, quote unquote, communities of black people, and white people wiped them right out. Exactly. And yet we're still talking about doing it again. So, yeah, it's very important that you know whatever, whatever you prescribe to. Um, whatever thoughts or theories or concepts that you ascribe to, that you take a look at how things work in the world and tell yourself the truth about that. You know, I can't stress that enough. Yeah, and a lot and I people, couldn't agree with you more. Go ahead, a lot of people won't won't do that. 
They'll say, oh, this happens because of this, and this happens because of this. Is that the, really the way the world works? I mean, take a, really take a look, a long, hard look at the way things work. You know, without using all these words to describe them. But, now, that's, that's extremely difficult to do. You know, but with practice, it can be done. I had a question about, well, it's supposed to everyone, is what, what are specific questions that you ask non-white people, especially black people, who are very focused on blaming or attacking other black people, especially poor black people? Like, what kind of questions do you ask them to kind of get them to see, to focus on the white people? Um, one thing I do ask is, why do you think you are in this position? I generally don't ask uh-huh. I'm sorry? No, go ahead, Mr. Will. Oh, uh, I was just saying I generally don't ask anything. I, I just try to refocus the conversation. Um, I usually ask, um, do you think it's a like a coincidence that black people all over the world are living in death, death, despair, and destruction. Do you think that just kind of happens? Or is there, do you think there's a specific reason for that? I love that approach. I found it to be quite effective. I'm kind of on the um, no longer talking to, um, like, not no longer attempting to have conversations with non-white people who um, show me they don't have the will or interest in um, solving this problem or realizing that there is a problem. So I can't answer that question. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a desire to help those that you feel could benefit from recognizing the global situation. But it's like, yeah, it, once you bang your head up against that wall, it's like it hurts and um, it, it, it can be a vulnerable piece to try and assist where assist is thrown back at you or not wanted or so... But it's it's laudable, right? It's it's a beautiful human um, or African or you know spiritual connection with the world that would that would say, hey, let me try and help brethren to to recognize. What was that movie? Anyone remember that movie uh, from a ba- a while back that tried to get the brother to wake up, and it was a he was a gang banger, and you know what I'm talking about? They brought him and showed him all these movies and, and kidnapped him to try and force him to recognize, and he just didn't. Oh, uh, Drop Squad. Yes. Yes, that, that reminds me of. Yeah, it's, a, it's a trip. But help is a process. You know, there, there can be a really thin line between help and harm. Hmm really thin line. Hmm. So if someone is not actually asking for help, um, you know, you can try to offer what you consider to be help, and that other person will perceive it as harm. 
So you have to really be careful if somebody is not uh, interested in receiving that information, if they're not ready to receive it, if they're not willing to receive it, then, you know, you may wind up harming that person rather than helping them. Well, he, he, I mean, you got to really be careful. Part of the reason I go towards some of the larger picture solutions, which which mean propaganda, I was thinking of getting. The, there was a picture of the ten stops, and it's it's well formatted. It looks great. I just want to print a bunch of business cards and just throw them out. You know, just see what happens. You know, I I, I did that. Um, years ago for a campaign, monetary campaign for a uh, MLM type program. And like, why not? Like, it, and whenever I'm interacting with someone uh, non-colored, just be like, I mean, a, a colored brother or sister, just be like, here, check this out. Because you just, you just never know. And I was talking earlier about the uh, Welsing group that I have, it's closed, it's private, and I screen people that come in, but I welcome just about anybody, right, as long as you can answer what racism is. This is a, a Francis Christ Welsing Solutions Group. And the concept is just, you know, I'm, I'm casting a very wide net, and I'm happy to feed anybody that has an inkling towards getting up and coming up because it doesn't have to necessarily be my way, but, oh, that one person that actually connects and gets it, my job is, is fulfilled. I, I joined Facebook that same way. It's like we, if we just reach one person, you never know what that one person. I know I've reached many people throughout the years, but that, that for me is what it's about, that global recognition that I can't solve everything, but I might solve one little person's problem, but that one little is very huge in the larger frame of, of reference. The, um, there's a story real quick about when you go to the beach and you kick the sand, you're essentially altering the face of the planet. And that's what's up. If you want to change the face of the planet, it's as big a job as you make it or as successful and uh, liberating as that concept is of what you're able to do. Every breath that you take. Ah, oh, who's that? Yeah, yeah, so. I think, um, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. Mr. Williams? Yes, sir. I think a really um, important or possibly important um, approach that one can take when um, attempting to get non-whites involved is something that um, I learned from Mr. Williams in a, in a call a while ago. We were talking, um, and it's about um, staying in, like, the help lane, like, thinking about what can you do to help so-and-so do so-and-so and if you could give that help while also talking about um the race problem then um that's like a two birds one nest type situation um so for my approach moving forward um when i i'm able to um be in contact with more people that's going to be my approach like well, uh, what can we do or what can i do to um to help you with that and looking for opportunities to talk about justice and getting that mind bug implanted in people just justice just what does it mean 
and wouldn't a system where no one is being mistreated, it wouldn't that be so great and so um, constructive for everyone on the planet? But that's something that I'll, I'm, I think would be really constructive. About that. Somebody told me one time about, uh, and, and I know that we've been uh, on this call for almost three hours, so we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, somebody told me once about uh, they were they were helping somebody on their job who was new to management and who had uh, some questions about how to manage people. Uh, this was a guy that uh, that um, we used to talk a lot years ago, and we still talk a lot every now and then on um, on Twitter. Uh, he was involved in you know pushing me to actually uh, create that website create, that's a bad word, uh, produce that website. Um, I think the, the website started about, uh, the Counter Racism website started in 2003. But prior to that, we used to all post on the code.net. You, some of you probably never even heard of that. It's, it's no longer, you know, it went away years ago. Um, and I'm not sure where all the archives of that, you know, John Bilal probably has all the archives of that since he owned that and still owns that uh, domain name. This guy posted on that. We had some really good conversations back then, too. Um, this guy posted back then that... Uh, he was helping this guy that was new to management and um, gave him some pointers and whatnot. And in the process of doing that, also asked him, would he be managing any white people? And um, the guy said, yeah, but he said the guy was a little confused as to, you know, why that was important. And uh, he began to point out, you know, well, you may experience this, you may experience that, and uh, here's what you do about it. And he said, you know, the guy contacted him uh, later on to tell him how helpful that information was because he got into some of those situations. He didn't know what to do. But that's just, you know, one example of, you know, helping somebody to solve a problem and at the same time working to solve the race problem. It's, it's really not difficult, you know, a thing to do. Uh, I'm not sure why a lot of people don't do it, but it's, it's really not that difficult to do. Uh, so one thing about the cows is um, they really focus on helping people to solve problems. Or, or I'm not sure if they still do that. I hope they still do that. I haven't listened in a long time. Um, but uh, they're really good about that. If you haven't listened to the Kyle's program, uh, please check them out. Uh, as far as I know, there's not very many counter-racism resources these days. You know, there's a counter-racism website, the counter-racism book club, the Kyle's, and I think that's just about it. You know, people have gotten away from putting forth the effort uh, for whatever reason. You know, not here to judge anybody, but uh, it seems like those are the only three resources around today. The Wellesley Institute, I don't know if that was mentioned, but that's still going on and is very constructive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. The, the, see, I, I, I forget things from time to time. After Dr. Wilson passed, you know, it was 
Oh man, I wish you guys could come to some of the wells and introduce me. So the guy that's on this call right now that spoke about that earlier, is he still on the call? Or did he drop off? Uh, I think it was Jamal who mentioned it earlier. Jamal, are you still there? I am. I am. So, spoke oh. about what? Mentioned the well. meeting me at the Wilson Institute. Was that oh, no, that was E-10, my bad. That was E-10. E oh, okay. okay. Silent Warrior, I'm sorry. Okay. So after the Wilson Institute, uh, a lot of people would get together. You know, Howard University had, you know, they got really strict rules, <laughs> you know. Dr. Wilson and, you know, could only have certain rooms for a certain period of time. But that didn't stop us. I mean, because after the Wilson Institute, we would huddle outside. I'm telling you, sometimes it was really, really cold, you know, in the D.C. area with that wind blowing, too. But we would huddle outside, and we would talk sometimes, you know, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, just, just talking about different things with uh, Dr. Wilson. Mr. Fuller would hang around a little while if he was actually doing a presentation at the Wilson Institute at that time, you know. I think he did that like two or three times a year. Um, but uh, we really had some really good conversations with Dr. Wilson. I wish you guys could have been a part of that. Um, and... Uh, yeah, Sabrina would have a yearly meeting at her house with everybody, you know, anybody who could come. And those were, and a lot of that content is is in rotation on the Counter Racism Radio Network. Uh, not trying to plug the site. I'm just trying to let people know that if you're interested in listening to some of that information or even watching on the, on the Counter Racism Television Network, which is also on the site, uh, there are videos, actually. Um, my first time at the Wilson Institute, I, I videoed it. And I think that was back in 2001. I actually videoed that, um, that particular uh, session. And that's on the website as well. So, Mr. Williams, I think it's perfectly okay for you to plug that site. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, I, I thank you. You know, I here, here. Like, agree. I haven't been paying much attention to it, but uh, I'm gonna try to get on the ball. <laughs> I apologize for that. I'm gonna try to get on the ball and get you know get things rolling again. I just purchased a. Um, an SSL, a secure certificate, so the whole website will be um, secure. Um, you know, back when it was started, that that wasn't a requirement. You know, only, you know, if you were doing e-commerce, it was re required to be secure, and that's always been the case for the Counter Racism Mall, but. Uh, these days, everybody wants everything secure. You know, whatever site they go to, they want the whole thing to be secure. And so um, I'm going to start working on that this week. So it's about, uh, we're about three hours in. Um, so I'm also going to, post on the web calendar to uh, to do this discussion once a week if everybody's interested in doing that. Sound like a woman to me. Okay. And uh, 05, I'll, I'll, I'll also post the Counter Racism uh, Book Club uh, the things that I know about that are happening. So if you want um, some additional things posted on the Counter Racism Web Calendar, I'll, I'll post them as well. So. 
Uh, would it be um, possible for you to send me this file so I can post it on a YouTube? This file? Yeah, the file. Yeah, this, this discussion. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. You, you, you'll, you'll find with me, I'm not, I'm not proprietary when it comes to kind of racism stuff. I'm really not, you know, unless it's a white person asking me to remove something. You know? <laughs> yeah. Then I become really proprietary, you know. <laughs> but as far as uh, people copying it and putting it here and putting it there, and no, I, I really don't care as long as they get the word out. Understood. Uh, understood. Okay. Well, it, it's been a really uh, good constructive conversation for me. I hope as well for others. Um, Indeed. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm definitely looking forward to next week. Okay. Same time? Uh, same time will work for me. Me too. Yes, I, that works for me as well. Yes. Okay, good deal. Works. I'll talk to thank everyone you. next week, God willing. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.